Welcome to this afternoon session. My name is Scott Moore, and I teach for the Great Text Program and the Philosophy Department here at Baylor, and I'm very pleased to welcome all of you today. Uh, we are pleased uh, to hear Ralph Wood this afternoon, and uh, many of you know Ralph. Some do not. Ralph is University Professor of Theology and Literature here at Baylor, and he te teaches and has taught throughout Baylor uh, in a number of different capacities. He uh, teaches in the religion department and in their graduate program. He teaches in the great text program, and he has taught in the George W. Truett Theological Seminary, as well as for our honors program in honors colloquia. So Ralph is a superb colleague that we're very glad to have. He hails from East Texas, as he likes to say, behind the pine curtain. But he did his graduate work at the University of Chicago and then taught for more than two decades at Wake Forest University in North Carolina. He has held numerous visiting academic appointments and he is on the road all the time speaking not only around the United States but around the world. He's been here at Baylor for 15 years, came in 1998, and uh, during the period of time, especially since he's been here at Baylor, he's been enormously productive. Uh, in addition to dozens and dozens of essays, there are several books, including complete monographs on G.K. Chesterton and Flannery O'Connor and J.R.R. Tolkien and much more. Today he'll be speaking on Kierkegaard's relationship to, uh, or Walker Percy's relationship and use of, of Kierkegaard, and Ralph's very first book was on Walker Percy and Kierkegaard. So he's been reading Walker Percy uh, and Kierkegaard all his life. So we will have the benefit of long, long reflection on uh, Walker Percy and Kierkegaard uh, from my dear friend Ralph Wood. It is no exaggeration to say that Ralph is one of the foremost scholars in America working at the intersection of theology and literature. But Ralph is far more than that. He is a very serious and devout Christian theologian who loves literature. And he understands the unique contribution that literary achievement can play to the life of faith and to the ordered life of faith. And he understands um, the flip side as well, that the Christian intellectual tradition and Christian theology uh, have extraordinary resources for helping us understand, respond to, uh, critique, and evaluate uh, the literary inheritance that comes to us. But all of these things you could read in the short bio that uh, is in the bulletin, I don't think that's why Dr. Davis asked me to introduce Ralph. He asked me to introduce Ralph because I've known Ralph for so long and I know where the bodies are buried. Uh, I've got a lot of stories I can tell on Ralph. In fact, it wouldn't be nearly as edifying um, as what he's going to say to us here, but I promise you that I could keep you entertained for uh, till 4.15. Uh, <laughs> just telling stories about Ralph. Ralph likes to say that his basic mode of operation is ready, fire, aim. And, and those of us who have had essays uh, that Ralph has critiqued and read for us and they came back uh, just bloodied up like something from ninth grade English uh, know what it is to receive Ralph's encouragement and edification. I would tell stories about Ralph, but Ralph also has stories about me. Uh, and so perhaps we'd better lean on that great Christian theologian Falstaff uh, who reminded us, of course, that the better part of valor is discretion. It, it might just be that I am left with that old standby line that so many of us have used in letters of recommendation, which is namely, if you knew him like I know him, you'd feel about him like I feel about him. The truth of the matter is, is that if you knew Ralph Wood the way I know Ralph Wood, then you would know him to be not only a world-class scholar and a tremendous classroom teacher, but a superb colleague, 
a devout churchman, a devoted husband, father, and family man, a true friend. And if you happen to find yourself in an academic bar fight, he's not a bad guy to have your back. Friends, it's my pleasure to welcome Ralph Wood and four comic cases of Kierkegaardian despair, a reading of Walker Percy's Love in the Ruins. Well, thank you very much, Scott Moore, I guess. Uh, on the contrary, it is indeed a great honor and delight to be here among friends, although that's a frightening proposition, as I tried to say recently. You can get up before an audience of total strangers and just let fly. The problem about speaking before friends is that they know in advance what a fraud you are, <laughs> and therefore are not going to be impressed with all the stuff you say. I would like to ask, however, an initial question um, for which I need uh, uh, an important answer. I have a short introduction to Walker Percy, the man, but I don't want to make it if everyone in the room already knows a great deal about Walker Percy. So could I just ask, how many of you have, say, only a brief kind of smidgen of knowledge about Percy and who thus might be helped by an introduction? Okay, I'll give it then. He's born in Birmingham in 1916. He's the son of a very prominent lawyer father uh, who could trace his ancestry back to the Percys of Northumberland. Uh, on his uh, paternal side, his mother, Martha Susan Finnessy, uh, had French Catholic ancestors. Uh, and so Percy comes from noble lineage. Uh, however, uh, the very dark, underbelly of Percy's life, displayed itself already uh, when he was only 16 years old, when he, together with his two brothers, was orphaned uh, when his father committed suicide. His father, using the same 20-gauge shotgun that his grandfather had killed himself with. Someone said rather cynically, the moral of that story is, get rid of that shotgun. As if the loss of his father were not enough um, to set his life profoundly ajar, um, he also lost his mother soon thereafter in a quite mysterious car drowning. She drove the family car off a bridge in broad daylight, um, did not have barriers, so there's some mystery about whether this was either an accident, a heart attack, a stroke, or a potential, in fact, suicide. Uh, the youngest son was with her, and he later reported she offered no help for his getting out. Fortunately, he was able to fight his way out, lowering a window and escaping, but she drowned. These three boys, Walker Percy and his two brothers, were then adopted by their father's first cousin, a man named William Alexander Percy. So though these boys would come to call him Uncle Will, he was in fact not their uncle, but their father's first cousin, so a somewhat distant relation. This man in his own right is quite worth your study, William Alexander Percy. I encourage you to read his autobiography called Lanterns on the Levee. It's a deep study of what it was like to grow up in the South prior to the First War. This man was one who had lost his faith. He had been reared Catholic, but had given it up, had become a self-described Stoic, um, and thus he was to be at once the greatest forming, shaping influence on Percy's life, but also the figure who haunted it more than any other. They had, of course, as you can see, a very tense relation. He admiring his, grand, his uh, adoptive uncle very greatly, but being deeply disturbed that this man, in his great goodness, his humanistic kind of excellence, saw no need for the Christian faith. In fact, he openly repudiated that faith while he was a student at Sewanee uh, in Tennessee. 
Percy studied then after graduating from high school there in Greenville, Mississippi. So he's born in Birmingham. He moves after his parents' death to Greenville, Mississippi. Um, he then goes on to the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, where he wins a BA degree in chemistry with high distinction, but emerges from Chapel Hill wanting to be a medical doctor, but having a totally physicalist view of human nature, that we are basically machines that can be better improved upon, better reformed by social and mechanistic methods that have nothing to do whatsoever with spiritual, much less Christian transformation. He never got over the fact that Harvard Medical School rejected him. He hated Harvard ever thereafter. He was, in fact, accepted at Columbia, took his MD degree there. Uh, concentrating in pathology, he had to make a, a very um, hard decision between psychiatry and pathology. And he chose, in the end, pathology, perhaps because, as some of my pathologist friends tell me, our patients never complain. He spent three of those four years at the Columbia Medical School in undergoing psychoanalysis. And I think um, without that psychoanalysis, Percy would never have emerged uh, to be the great man and great writer he became. Turned out she was a woman, and he obviously found in her a kind of surrogate mother, but also a woman who helped him be an independent man who would not be a kind of perpetual um, psychiatric case. Um, but he was still very deeply troubled after leaving Columbia. He stayed on to do his residency there in New York City at the Physicians and Surgeons Hospital, uh, doing research on the cadavers of tuberculosis victims. And very unwisely, they practiced their pathological research without wearing gloves or masks. And so half of the team came down with tuberculosis. Uh, Percy had a long recuperation in a couple of upstate New York sanatoria. Um, and there he began to immerse himself in figures such as the following. Søren Kierkegaard, Albert Camus, Fyodor Dostoevsky, Leo Tolstoy, Jean-Paul Sartre, Thomas Mann. But also thanks to a Catholic fellow patient there, he also began to read the theology of Thomas Aquinas. He felt that all of these thinkers, these artists, probed the human condition in ways that made him wonder whether he was really meant to be a physician or not. In fact, though he earned his medical degree, did his residency, he never one day practiced medicine at all. Though, as he said, I never lost the physician's impulse to thump the patient and find out what's wrong. Having gradually recovered from tuberculosis, um, having seen that he really didn't want to become a medical doctor, he was still very deeply, personally at sea, not really knowing what to do with himself. He was a wanderer, both spiritually and geographically. He found himself, to use a favorite metaphor that he adopts over and again, of course, from the prodigal son, he found himself in 1947 when, on a trip with his closest friend, fellow resident of Greenville, fellow North Carolina grad, Shelby Foote, on a trip together with Foote to the New Mexico desert, he found himself in a very strange way. He announced himself to Foote's total astonishment that he was returning to New Orleans, there to marry, a nurse whom he had gotten to know, a Baptist nurse named Mary Bernice Townsend, that both of them would then be received into the Roman Catholic Church after proper instruction as converts. And as several papers have pointed out, Percy would confess over and again um, that his conversion to the Christian faith was due largely to the analysis of the modern malaise, as he liked to call it, by Sir and Kierkegaard. So for the students here from Letourneau uh, University and from Union and from Georgetown, I commend to you the book that converted Walker Percy. Uh, it used to be available in this little volume called The Present Age, 
because in that same collection, that's a marvelous book itself, essay itself, there's a little short essay called On the Difference Between a Genius and an Apostle. Now, Steve Evans and others may wag their head in great disdain that urging students to begin here, but this is at least one good place to begin, especially if you want to see how Walker Percy was converted uh, by reading that book. And yet, though he was converted to the Christian faith by reading Kierkegaard, he could not go the way of Kierkegaard. Uh, he believes, some of you believe, some of you, I think, convinced me, he thought quite wrongly that Kierkegaard was an irrationalist. Um, and that therefore his answer to our sickness unto death, his favorite, other favorite book by Kierkegaard, uh, was insufficient. It was insufficient, I think, for two reasons, and that is Percy as a scientist wanted to have a tradition that would give the whole universe uh, a sense of its cosmic order. He felt he could not find that in Kierkegaard. There was too much absurdity in Kierkegaard. There was not enough of what he called the ranging up and down of the whole order of things that, of course, the Catholic world, especially of Aquinas, gave him. The other reason that my friend John Sykes has helped me come to, I think, quite rightly, um, is that Percy feared what might happen to him if he went the way of Kierkegaard. And that is, Walker Percy was a lonely figure. He was a solitaire. Um, he was shy. He had exceedingly great difficulty in any kind of public arena. Uh, the joke later became that when he would publish a book, he would not go on the lecture, on the, on the um, book tour, because you had to have uh, interviews on TV. And you couldn't have an interview on the TV unless you crossed your leg and had over-the-calf socks. He said, I don't own any over-the-calf socks, and so I can't have TV interviews. He obviously didn't want TV interviews. And so I think he saw himself as in danger of being sucked into the vortex of self-reflexivity, where he'd be thinking about himself, thinking about himself, thinking about himself, and then thinking about himself, thinking about himself, thinking about himself. And that would lead, finally, if not to his, the suicide of his father and grandfather, to his own terrible, terrible um, frustration and end. In fact, Percy um, was haunted his whole life by suicide. He said, not altogether in jest, the chief question of my life is, will I kill myself? That's partly a joke, but I think of this at the same time, not a joke. He was impressed with Camus' famous quip that the only philosophical question worth asking is the question of suicide. Walker and Butt Percy, after living for a few years in New Orleans, uh, in the Garden District, uh, eventually settled in Covington, Louisiana, which is across Lake Pontchartrain from New Orleans. And there, Percy spent the remainder of his life um, working as an essayist, novelist, as well as a quiet but still very firm opponent of Southern racial discrimination. Uh, he was active in an organization run by a couple of Protestants uh, called Katalagata, Be Reconciled, that fought hard against the horrors of Southern racism. I learned just last year in visiting New Orleans that no blacks could get loans to buy homes with in Covington because they couldn't have enough principal to put down on a loan that would allow the loan agency then to give them a loan. Walker Percy saw to it that wealthy white Coventonians got together and helped the blacks set up a, lo a lending agency that would give them loans without initial, initial uh, down payment. He died in 1990, and he's buried in the cemetery of a nearby Benedictine Abbey, which he attended often. Um, beneath a gravestone that at his own insistence was to be no different from that of the hundreds of monks, I mean not hundreds, scores of monks buried there, with only this difference. Walker Percy, 1916, 1990, writer, writer. 
During these 43 years, from 1947 to 1990, Percy wrote six novels, Movie Gore, Last Gentleman, Love in the Ruins, Lancelot, Second Coming, Thanatos Syndrome. He also, during this, these same years, penned two collections of essays, The Message in the Bottle, and a very funny book called Lost in the Cosmos, the last self-help book. Some of you know about that. Other uh, uncollected essays, reviews, and interviews were posthumously published in 1991 under the title Signpost in a Strange Land. And then in 1992, Jay Tolson followed with what I think is the indispensable biographical study of Walker Percy entitled Pilgrim in the Ruins. That would be the place to get started if you want to read some about Percy's own life, Pilgrim in the Ruins, Walker Percy by J. Tolson. Well, the movie goer, as I've heard Jonathan Sands uh, demonstrated this afternoon at a session I was unable to attend, but that Kathleen Norris hailed very highly, um, is surely Percy's most Kierkegaardian novel. That case has been made in numerous places. I've tried myself to make that case. And yet, I want us to turn our attention today to Love in the Ruins, um, because I think it's, it's by far his funniest novel. I don't actually encourage you to begin with the movie gore. It employs such Kierkegaardian indirect communication that often the kind of deep um, commitments that underlie that novel are very difficult to discern if you don't have a lot of background in Percy, whereas Love in the Ruins, my, lot, my wife will not let me read after 10 o'clock in the evening because I'll wake her up cackling, though I've read it at least 20 times. The book is a mock epic. It's an anti-epic, uh, and therefore it's an anti-heroic work. Um, and as such, it doesn't extol the highest virtues of the age, as of course a classical epic does of the kind we get from Virgil and Homer, uh, even from Milton. And it, instead, it exposes the worst follies and stupidities of these latter days of our personal and cultural self-abandonment. That means that he is taking the hide off all of the idiocies of the 1960s and since many of my students, like many of you, were not then living, you have to have annotations to catch those references. Just as within a generation of Dante's death, you already had to have an annotation to figure out whom Dante was talking about. So on my website, this is shameless self-advertisement, I have a free 26 single space page list of annotations to Love in the Ruins that I, I hope might help you. It's also a futuristic dystopia, and it's set in the year 1984, though it's published in the year 1971. And of course, what Percy is doing is just reversing the Orwellian year of 48 to 84, not that he expected the apocalypse to occur in 84. The action occurs around um, a huge local crisis in the New Orleans area about the possibility of a nuclear war that would be set off um, by way of a huge social conflagration there in New Orleans that would spread outwardly to possibly the, the, the president actually pulling the trigger on the nuclear bomb box that he carries with him. His protagonist and anti-hero is a man named in honor of Sir slash Saint Thomas More the noble Catholic humanist and martyr of the 16th century. And yet, this latter-day Moore is neither honorable nor godly. On the contrary, he is a self-confessed bad Catholic. In fact, I've learned here this weekend that Percy's publishers tried to get him to drop that subtitle, fearing that nobody would want to read a novel about a confessions of a bad Catholic, and Percy insisted that we do so, that, that the, the novel do so. And so he depicts himself in what are surely not winsome, but surely are very witty Kierkegaardian terms. So if you look at the first quote on the handout, does everybody have one of those? We've got plenty. Back in the back, do you guys have handouts? Along the chairs here, there are numerous handouts, so please. 
I try to give something for people to take home for the bottom of their bird cage. <laughs> this is a confession that, confers, that, that occurs very early in the novel on page six. So be sure everybody has a, a handout. I, for example, am a Roman Catholic, albeit a bad one. I believe in the Holy Catholic Apostolic and Roman Church, in God the Father, in the election of the Jews, in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, who founded the church on Peter, his first vicar, which will last until the end of the world. Some years ago, however, I stopped, this is a phrase he'll use over and again, I stopped eating Christ in communion, stopped going to Mass, and have since fallen into a disorderly life. That term is going to come back up. That's an Augustinian term, a disorderly life. I believe in God and the whole business, but I love women best. Music and science next. Whiskey next. God fourth. And my fellow man hardly at all. Generally, I do as I please. A man wrote John, he's referring to the epistle of John, who says he believes in God and does not keep his commandments is a liar. If John is right, then I'm a liar. Nevertheless, I still believe. What we're going to find out, of course, belief is not enough. And this is a point that will be at once Kierkegaardian and non-Kierkegaardian. Well, it should be obvious that Moore is uh, far from satisfied with his self-indulgent life. He's given himself over to what I would call a kind of antic, despairing decadence because he's found all of the other alternatives completely untenable. Moore blames Descartes and his epigony for our late modern sickness unto death. And what my colleague Barry Harvey has taught me to regard as the single most prophetic line of the entire novel, unfortunately it's not there on the handout, is this. He speaks of what he calls the dread chasm within Western man ever since the famous philosopher Descartes ripped body loose from the mind and turned the very soul into a ghost that haunts its own house. Could I repeat that? Since the famous philosopher Descartes ripped body loose from mind and turned the very soul into a ghost that haunts its own house. From Occam and Scotus on to Kant and Newton and Locke, Percy believes that we Westerners have treated the activities of the intellect as a discarnate operation. We have regarded it as a faculty existing independently of the body and thus as abstracted from history and tradition and location. This phantom-like soul finds its only life in either autonomous ethical action or else subjective religious experience. You see where we're going. You've got on the first, the left, and on the right, the latter, the right, within the Christian world at least. The moralism of the left is echoed by the pietism of the right, and both of them are individualist, individualist to the core. Among the novel's most hilarious passages are those found in Moore's acute di diagnoses of what passes as political and religious life in America. He discerns, for example, that for all of their mutual anathematizing of each other, the extremists on the right and the left are unconscious mirror images of each other. The Roman Catholic Church, for example, has renamed itself the American Catholic Church. It has established its headquarters in Cicero, Illinois. Some of you know the most Italian and the most segregated seg uh, suburb of Chicago and most Catholic. It has adopted the central item of the old Allstate ad from the television, which was a suburban house surrounded by a white picket fence as its logo. Therefore, it celebrates Property Rights Sunday, and the American flag is raised when the priest elevates the host in the holiest moment of the Mass. Liberal Catholics fare no better. Leftist priests, having already won the right to marry, are now agitating for the right to remarry after they have become divorced. Liberal Protestants must have evaporated entirely by this time, for they don't even merit a mention. 
Evangelical Protestants, however, are alive, but very barely to be considered well. They have given themselves over almost entirely to entertainment. They have developed golf courses, for example, that can be played at night. Steve Evans, I'm sure we might have one of those. And their tournament slogan is Jesus Christ, the greatest pro of them all. <laughs> Proctology has become the medical science of the future as the way to the truth lies in our bowels rather than our hearts. Constipation is the conservative complaint since conservatives can't let go of anything. <laughs> Liberals, by contrast, suffer from diarrhea, being unable to hold on to anything. The nation's political parties have descended even lower into this financially prosperous and health-obsessed hell. Though, of course, they regard themselves as dread enemies, they are, in fact, mirror images, mirror image twins. So if you look at the second quote there, remember, this was written, published in 1971. He was writing it in 68, 69, and listen to its currency. Some southern states have established diplomatic ties with Rhodesia. Minnesota and Oregon have their own consulates in Sweden. The old Republican Party has become the knothead party, so named during the Republican Convention in Montgomery, Alabama. And of course, he's remembering the 1964 Republican Convention in San Francisco, where Barry Goldwater famously said, extremism in the defense of virtue is no vice, and what's the rest of that sentence? And so something else is no virtue. But anyhow, um, it's a kind of a defense of extremism, so they've taken that over. They're the knothead party. They have printed a million more buttons reading knotheads for America and banners proclaiming no man can be too knotheaded in the service of his country. <laughs> the old Democrats gave way to the new left party, L-E-F-T, usually it is often left Papa, sometimes left Papa San, hardly ever the original left Papa Sane, which stood for what, according to the right, the left believed that liberty, equality, fraternity, the pill, atheism, anti-pollution, sex, abortion now, euthanasia. Then in a dark line from William Butler Yeats, he says, the center did not hold. However, the gross national product continues to rise. There are left states and not head states. There are left towns and not head towns. Dallas is a not head city. Austin is a left city. Left networks and not head networks, Fox and CNN. The most popular left films are dirty movies from Sweden. For example, depicting Philadio being performed in midair by parachutists. <laughs> All time not head favorites, on the other hand, include <laughs> the sound of music, <laughs> flubber, <laughs> sorry. And Ice Capage 1981. Clean movies all. Both political parties have had their triumphs. The left succeeded in having In God We Trust removed from pennies. The knotheads enacted a law requiring compulsory prayer in the black public schools and made funds available for birth control for in Africa, Asia, and Alabama. <laughs> should be obvious then that Walker Percy is not just indulging in extremely witty satire, he's instead borrowing from Sir and Kierkegaard. Because for Kierkegaard, faith and salvation are not found in assent to a set of propositions, but in the willingness to be constituted as a self existing transparently before God as a synthesis of body and soul, as he says in Sickness Unto Death, with a view to being a spirit. Though even then one lives, and we've heard repeatedly this weekend, one lives in fear and trembling, lest one relapse into the condition of despair. That word, of course, is Kierkegaard's synonym for damnation. It does not consist in committing immoral acts, but the unwillingness to become such a self. To despair and thus to be damned is to fall into, onto one side or the other of Kierkegaard's dialectical set of opposites. 
or else to make an improper synthesis of them. I brought along the yellow version that Kathleen Norris to told about last time. How many of you own a copy of this version? Great, great. Mine has fallen completely to pieces, but all you have to do is open your, 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 your copy to the table of contents, and there uh, we, he says despair viewed under the aspect of finitude in, and infinitude. The despair of infinitude is due to the lack of finitude. The despair of finitude is due to the lack of infinitude. The despair of possibility is due to the lack of necessity. The despair of necessity is due to the lack of possibility. So you get this dialectic borrowed straight from Kierkegaard, the eternal, the temporal, infinitude, finitude, possibility, necessity, self-consciousness, unself-consciousness, spirit, spiritlessness, to use Catholic terms, grace, nature, or to use Percy's terms, angelism and bestialism. Be sure you understand that word is now pronounced bestialism because when it becomes uh, a collective noun, it gets the short E, bestialism. Percy has Tom Moore, the psychiatrist, doctor, protagonist, recast these opposites, as I've just said, into the twin diseases of angelism and bestialism. Like angels, he argues, we attempt to invent ourselves out of whole cloth, floating transcendently in the realm of infinite possibility, denying our created condition as finite and embodied souls. We, or, we therefore abstract ourselves from the traditions and convictions that root us in time and place, becoming virtual angels orbiting the earth. And that's one of Percy's favorite metaphors, angels orbiting the earth. Or else, like beasts, we seek to plunge beneath our condition as spiritual animals by sinking into total physicality, denying our created condition as ensouled bodies. So for Kierkegaard, I think it's for Christian tradition, we are both embodied souls in soul bodies. We avoid the latter problem of bestialism. We, we enact the latter problem of bestialism by immersing ourselves in comforts and conveniences, in money and possessions, becoming little more than contented animals. In both states of this damnable despair, we deny Pascal's splendid description of the human condition as, this is one of Percy's favorites, ne ange ne bet, neither angel nor beast. As Percy points out, no other anthropoid kills for pleasure as do we men. No other female animal than the woman can remain in a state of perpetual estrus, the animal word heat thus being capable of sexual attraction and sexual intercourse without regard to times or seasons. Because Moore understands these polarities, that Percy is clearly borrowed from Kierkegaard, he is exceedingly impatient with those who fail to integrate them into human wholeness. Yet, as a lapsed Catholic, Moore also despairs of any spiritual cure to this sickness unto death. And so he has invented an encephalogram-like machine, which he calls a lapsometer. He takes its name from the Latin lapsus, or fall, for it can allegedly detect the extent from which we have fallen away from our true condition as angel beasts or beast angels. And so more despairing of any spiritual cure, resorts to this, notice, notably mechanistic image in calling his lapsometer the first caliper of the soul. Initially, Moore uses this device to detect um, polar imbalances, but he gradually comes to believe that he can, by means of complex brain stimulations, that this sophisticated machine can also heal, can also heal these imbalances. And so he can use it, he thinks, to galvanize these areas of the brain that control bestialism and angelism 
energizing those that we underutilize and dampening down those that we overutilize. Hence his crucial description of this machine on quote number three. If you measure, this is an attack on Descartes, by the way, who <laughs> crazily thought the soul was located in the pineal gland. Some of you can tell me about why that's the case, I don't know. If you measure the pineal activity of a monkey or any other subhuman animal with my lapsometer, you will inevitably record identical readings of layers one and two. Itself, that is to say, coincides with itself. Only in man do you find a discrepancy. Layer one, the outer social self, ticking over, say, at a sprightly 5.4 micromillivolts, while layer two, the inward private self, just lies there, barely alive at 0 0.7 micromillivolts, or even zero. Totally, of course, unselfconscious. Only in man does the self miss itself fall from itself, hence, lapsometer. Suppose, suppose I could hit on the right dosage and well the broken self whole. What if man could re-enter paradise, so to speak, and live there both as man and spirit, whole and intact man spirit, as solid flesh as a speckled trout, a dappled thing, yet aware of itself as a self. It's a direct steal from Gerard Manley Hopkins. Great poem. Well, the story of how Moore's experiment with this cure-all machine both succeeds and fails is far too complex to recount here. Suffice it to say instead that Moore makes brilliant Kierkegaardian analyses of this split modern soul, <clears throat> and yet he also forsakes Kierkegaard as well as his own lapsed Catholicism, Catholicism when he begins to use the angelism, bestialism spectrum to try to heal this deadly cleft. So consider these four cases, these four case histories from Moore's psychiatric practice, and they form the opening pages of uh, Love in the Ruins. Patient number one is P.T. Bledsoe. As his name indicates, he is one of P.T. Barnum's pathetic suckers whose very soul is hemorrhaging Bledsoe in sheer bestial rage despite his worldly success in traditional conventional endeavors. He is so sunk in finitude and necessity that he believes the world is closing in on him. And so he's turned paranoid, convinced that everyone is out to get him. He, of course, is a hardcore Republican who hates Jews and blacks. He believes the Jews are engaged in a huge conspiracy to take over um, the um, uh, Federal Reserve. And he hates blacks because, of course, they're threatening his, his white racial purity. So it's clear that Bledsoe is hardly a self in Kierkegaard's sense at all, since he has no real consciousness of his despair because of his own misery. And so Dr. Moore recommends that he indeed, Bledsoe, move to the outback of Australia, which is what he wants to do, especially, this is more, if there's not a Jew or black for a hundred miles around. Note well, this therapy will leave Bledsoe essentially unchanged, a man who will overcome his paranoia by skipping the country. This is the, the next quote on the, on the page. I found it an effective rule of therapy to accept as more self-evident every day a certain state of affairs, namely, that most people nowadays are possessed, harboring as they do all manner of demonic hatred and terrors and lusts and envies, a prophetic phrase here that principalities and powers are nearly everywhere victorious and that therefore a doctor's first duty to his patient is to help him find breathing room and so to keep him from going crazy. If PT can't stand blacks and builder burgers, my experience is that there's not time enough to get, up, get him over it. 
even if I could, so let him go to Australia. Patient number two is Ted Tennis. As his name, name indicates, this playboy is as shallow as one can imagine. Tennis is an overly intellectual graduate student, none of these in the room, so obsessed with all of the theoretical possibilities open to him that he orbits the earth in sheer angelic abstraction. So where we've moved from radical sinkage in necessity and finitude now to an utter abstraction into an angelic sphere. Rather than making husbandly love to his wife Tanya, another interesting name, he quakes with terror at having sexual intercourse with her fearing that he could not, this is his own phrase, achieve an adequate response. He thus hopes that Dr. Moore will fit him with a penile training organ that will cure his impotence. Instead, Moore assigns him what he calls an ordeal of immersion into radical finitude and utter unselfconsciousness. So rather than gliding back home, through the swamp, sorry, back home along the interstate in his air conditioner sports car, Moore insists that Tennis walk home through the swamps of southern Louisiana so that he might be reeled back to earth from his seraphic condition. For here we find for a change considerable improvement as Moore offers Tennis a serious moral and physical challenge. This is the next quotation. The six miles took him five hours. At 10 o'clock that night, he staggered up his backyard past the barbecue grill, half dead of fatigue, having been devoured by mosquitoes, leeches, vampire bats, setsy flies, snapped at by alligators, moccasins, copperheads, set upon by, sorry, set upon by a couple of Michigan State dropouts on a bummer <laughs> who mistook him for a parent. <laughs> it was every bit of the ordeal I had hoped. And so it came to pass, listen to the biblical language, so it came to pass that half dead and stinking like a catfish, Ted fell into the arms of his good wife Tanya and made lusty love to her the rest of the night. Patient number three is Charlie Parker the clever inventor of night golf. A 50-year-old, this is a, one of Percy's best names, bourbon-cured stud of a man <laughs> who has begun looking at himself in the mirror, asking, what in the hell does it mean? What does it all mean, Doc? He says to Moore. Having no resources for answering his own question, Parker becomes prone to acute depression. You see where we are? He's sunk in finitude and necessity, but he's coming to a kind of minimal awareness that something is wrong. So he's at least moving toward the possibility of authentic selfhood by this bare minimal awareness of his despair. And this, alas, gives more the opening for the first actual use of his lapsometer, not only to diagnose, but also to cure. And so he uses it to free Parker from feeling suffocated by the seemingly meaningless limits of his finitude so that he might find a fresh new possibility. And yet, notice, it's an opening to an entirely earthly infinitude, what Kierkegaard would call an imminent infinitude, a deadly cure indeed. The next quote. I saw how his life was and what he needed. Charlie was a tinkerer, a fellow who has to have one idea to worry with 24 hours a day. Without it, he's blown up. Charlie's the sort of fellow who retir retires to Florida, hale and hearty, and perishes in six months, wearing yellow pants, smoking a cigar, and drinking martinis, I might add. I gave him a pineal massage, and he came to himself, that same phrase, his old self, and began to have one idea after another. One idea was an electronic, unlosable golf ball <laughs> that sends signals from the deepest rough. Another was a golf-arama, 
a mystical idea of combining a week of golf on a Caribbean island with a week of revivals conducted by a member of the old Billy Graham team <laughs> led by Cliff Barrows, I should have added, who died only recently, by the way. Patient number four is Chuck Parker, the son of Charlie Parker. Having made a perfect score on the SAT, Chuck had finished three years at MIT before he dropped out. He now spurns the bourgeois success that his father stands for. In fact, Chuck has taken his secular Jewish girlfriend, a Smith College refugee, to live as a back-to-nature couple in the swamps, together with their love baby that they've fostered. Together with other such Woodstockian types, they smoke Choctaw cannabis. They live in, this is these are their phrase, in perfect freedom and peace. They tell each other the exact truth, and they find God in rare birds they spot there in the swamps. It's evident that in throwing over the stifling conformity of both Southern prosperity and Yankee intellectualism, Chuck and his girlfriend Ethel have made an important leap into the possibility of true selfhood. Yet again, because Moore is powerless to demonstrate to them what it might mean to live transparently before God, they reach for new age-like substitutes that will sooner or later fail. Here, however, in this scene, there is a slight hint of true transcendence, and it's largely found in the figure of Ethel. I think her last name is Finkelstein. It's, it's as Jewish as you can get, though she's non-practicing. She is not too far from true selfhood, according to Moore, because in her lapsometer reading, she has an utter contradictory indication of both abstractness and concreteness, both infinitude and finitude, both eternality and temporality. She's become a sort of angel beast, and Moore thinks that, he should, that she could be rendered permanently whole if he could just administer the right dosage from his now lapsometer that can be used to stimulate certain areas of the brain. Fortunately, he's kept from doing that when one of the local Louisiana salt domes, you probably know there are these huge salt domes in South Louisiana that give off actually sulfuric gases. Uh, one of them begins to give off its gas, a kind of indication that hell is near, and thus interrupts uh, Moore's attempt to cure her permanently. And Com Again, the reasons there are too complex um, to try to explain what happens then. So part three and last. Gradually, Moore discovers <clears throat> that the split state of the American moral and spiritual life cannot be knit back together by even the most sophisticated machines, machine. It requires a far more radical remedy, as Moore learns. In the meantime, he becomes ever more discouraged. Though his nation seems to be prospering despite its deadly divisions of right and left, Moore himself is miserable. The three women whom he is shacked up with and who are at his beck and call cannot bodily satisfy him, nor can he stop the ramblings of his own mind by drinking his endless gin fizzes. He breaks out in hives every time he tries to have sex with one of these women in clear revolt of his body against his soul. Moore prospers only when he's mocking the twin idiocies of our culture, since he can't find any, find any vital alternative to them. And so he gradually begins to discern that he's living in hell. Though the suburb is called Paradise Estates, it is in fact a precinct of perdition. Unlike nearly everyone else, Moore detects the poisonous odors pervading the moral atmosphere like gas from an extermination camp. Far from being a place whose inhabitants might glimpse the beatific vision, it is a realm of unacknowledged damnation. Nowhere do these invisible hellish forces exert themselves more dramatically 
than in a scene involving Father Rinaldo Smith. And Percy gets in a wonderful kind of <clears throat> suggestion here. The main Catholic Church having become the American Catholic Church, there's this tiny, tiny remnant of true Catholics led by a man with a Hispanic initial name, Ronaldo, and the ultimate wasp white name, Smith, Ronaldo Smith. One Sunday as Smith stood to deliver the homily at the Catholic Church, he fell stone silent, unable to utter a word. The, the parishioners, of course, come running forward as he's at the pulpit and grab him and rush him to the sacristy. And there they have him then committed to a, the local psychiatric hospital. Assuming, of course, that he's had a nervous breakdown, collapse. There, instead, he explains that his aphasia, his inability to speak, has not been caused by a brain malfunction or to any defect in the microphone. He declares instead that they're jamming the circuits. They're jamming the circuits. He refers not to electronic gremlins or glitches, but to those same principalities and powers we heard from before. Smith says they've won and we've lost. Death is winning, life is losing. In one of the novel's most haunting sentences, for me at least, this modest little priest confesses, I am surrounded by the corpses of souls. We live in a city of the dead. So here Percy begins to move, I think, beyond the limits of Kierkegaard, though at times one wishes he might have remained more tentatively Kierkegaardian than so acerbically Catholic. At his worst, Percy employed his art to spew venom against the culture of death and the age of ashes. Angrily and often terribly impatiently, he warned against the wrath to come, as if he were himself the bringer of this final sentence of doom. He likened the aim of his work indeed to the function of the proverbial canary in a coal mine, saying, of course, that when the canary begins to gasp and keel over, the, the coal miners know to make their hasty exit. So when this Walker Percy, the one who's become the angry scold, um, writes, he writes badly. And to me, his worst novel is his last novel, The Thanatos Syndrome. I have a hard time reading it at all. By contrast, Percy acts as a true prophet, legitimately, I think, when he does not employ his art for propaganda, when he does not violate either, that is to say, his fiction or his faith. Instead, he speaks with the authority of his own Catholic Church and its moral teachings, especially its papal encyclicals and letters. The signature encyclical of the blessed John Paul II to be canonized in April is surely Evangelium Vitae, the Gospel of Life from 1995. There the late Pope observed the huge irony that in an enlightenment era that boasts of its discovery of inviolable human rights. And I'm quoting him, I wish I had this on the quote, but it's not on the sheet, it's not there in its vaunted discovery of inviolable human rights, the, the very right to life is being denied or trampled upon, especially at the more significant moments of existence, the moments of birth and the moment of death. For once our souls are numbed and deadened in the way Kierkegaard feared the human body itself will be defiled. This is a quotation again from Evangelium Vitae. Within this same cultural climate, the body is no longer perceived as a proper personal reality, a sign and place of relations with others, with God and with the world. It is reduced to pure materiality. It is simply a complex of organs, functions, and energies 
to be used according to the sole criteria of pleasure and efficiency. Consequently, sexuality too is depersonalized and exploited. From being the sign, place, and language of love, that is, of the gift of the self, Kierkegaardian phrase, and the acceptance of another in all of the other's richness, the body increasingly becomes the occasion and instrument for self-assertion and the selfish satisfaction of personal desires and instincts. That's from, paragraph, uh, from section one, paragraph 23. It's on the web, you can find it very easily. Five years earlier, in the year of his death in 1990, Walker Percy wrote a letter to the, our national newspaper of record. That the New York Times refused to print Percy's letter makes it all the more worth our hearing. And I have it there in the handout. The most influential book published in German in the first quarter of the 20th century was entitled The Justification of the Destruction of Life Devoid of Value. His co-authors were the distinguished jurist Carl Binding and the prominent psychiatrist Alfred Hoke. Neither Binding nor Hoke had ever heard of Hitler or the Nazis, nor in all likelihood did Hitler ever read the book. He didn't have to. I would not wish to be understood as implying that the respected American institutions I've named, and here they are, the New York Times, the United States Supreme Court, the American Civil Liberties Union, the National Organization of Women, I would not, he says, be understood as implying that they are similar or corresponding to pre-Nazi institutions. But I do suggest that once the line is crossed, once the principle gains acceptance, juridically, medically, socially, that innocent human life can be destroyed for whatever reason, for the most admirable socioeconomic, medical, and social reasons, then it does not take a profit to predict what will happen next. Or if not next, then sooner or later. At any rate, a warning is in order. Depending on the disposition of the majority, and the opinion polls, now in favor of allowing women to get rid of unborn and unwanted babies, it is not difficult to imagine an electorate or a court 10 years, 50 years from now, who would favor getting rid of useless old people, retarded children, antisocial blacks, illegal Hispanics, gypsies, Jews. That's Percy at his most prophetic, but notice he's not speaking, using his fiction to score points. He's writing directly, speaking with authority, not authority that he has accrued to himself by any direct unmediated relation to God, but by the authority given to him through his own place in the Catholic Church. At his best, especially his early work, where Percy does not feel compelled to preach, he fictionally depicts a more excellent way than the way of our living death. For the same Thomas More whom we have seen dwelling in hell begins to discover that the demons in his own life need to be driven out. And there are four non, what I think to be non-Kierkegaardian moments that stand out from others. Early in the novel, Moore burst out in both rage and grief against what Percy calls the merd in which he is living. He slashes his wrists on Christmas Eve. He attempts this nihilistic act of self-murder after watching Perry Como, presumably a Catholic of Italian descent, dressed natally in his cardigan and sitting contentedly on his stool as he crooned sacrilegiously about the holiest night of the year. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas just like the Christmases I knew 
where the dewdrops glisten and snowflakes do something. For Walker Percy, his character Tom Moore, that's reason to kill yourself. That is to say, this is sacrilege of the highest unrecognized order. And yet, like the prodigal son, again, this self-lacerating moor suddenly comes to himself. He squeezes his bleeding wrist into his armpits and hobbles like a hobo back to a, a hospital to get himself sutured up by his doctor friend. She says, bad as things are still, when all is said and done, one can sit on a doorstep in the winter and watch sparrows kick leaves. It's something far greater is required of more than such a quiet Panglossian resignation to his own little garden spot. And so he commits himself to the psychiatric ward at the local hospital. And there, in the insane asylum, the psychiatric ward, he enjoys some of the happiest moments of his life. For among these other demented souls, he is thoroughly at home. Percy thus suggests that in an hour as late as ours, the only sanity may be found in a certain kind of insanity as he becomes fully aware of his own despair. This is on the page again. Here I spent the best months of my life in the day room and in the ward, we patients came to understand each other as only fellow prisoners and exiles can. Sane, outside, I can't make head or tail of people. Mad, inside, we signal each other like auctioneers, a wink here, a wag a finger there. I listened and watched. Outside, there is not time to listen. Sitting here in the day room in the day on the day after Christmas next to a mangy pine tree decorated with very colored Kleenex, no glass, lest somebody cut their wrist. My hands on my knees and my wrist bandaged. I felt so bad that I groaned an Old Testament lamentation. Oh! To which responded a great silent black man sitting next to me on the blocky couch. Ain't it the truth though? Yet again, Moore cannot permanently dwell among the deranged. His dormant Catholic conscience reminds him that his troubles are far more self-generated than culturally induced. Hence his remarkable confession. Even as he still flirts with a pretty nurse who attends him in the hospital and whom he will eventually marry. Note well, note well, that more here in this deeply Augustinian confession moves outward rather than inward. Again, it's on your, your sheet. Later, lust gave way to sorrow, and I prayed, arms stretched out like a Mexican, tears streaming down my face. Dear God, I can see it now. Why can't I see it at other times, that it's you I love in the beauty of the world and in all the lovely girls and in dear good friends? And it is pilgrims we are, wayfarers on a journey, not pigs nor angels. Why can I not be merry and loving like my ancestor, a gentle, pure-hearted, Kierkegaardia reference here, knight for Our Lady? and our blessed Lord and Savior. Pray for me, Sir Thomas More. Et cetera, et cetera, a regular Valpurgis knight of witches, devils, pitchfork, pitchforks, thorns in the flesh, up needs girl thighs, followed by contrition and clear sight, followed, of course, by my old friend, morning terror. In other words, a breakthrough that's occurred privately in his hospital room, but having no social Confirmation, no social direction, above all, no ecclesial direction, puts him right back where he started in only a few minutes. Unlike his, sorry, like his fictional creator, Moore will not let us sentimentalize this deeply Augustinian confession that evil is a terrible nothing, a privation or absence of good, 
and thus the pain of absolute loss. Uh, I've talked with a friend at lunch today from Fordham about her paper on evil in Kierkegaard, asking whether Kierkegaard had a privation uh, understanding of evil. And she answered, I accept her authority. No, he does not. Moore knows that he must reorder his loves to the love of God, lest he continue to twist and pervert his joys into a deathly hell of his own making. Yet, he lacks the will to do it. As Augustine taught, his will is turned in upon itself, in cravatus in se, and thus requires transcendent deliverance. Hence the spiritual ennui of Moore's repeated et ceteras, et ceteras, his slothful indifference to the good that he knows would require him to leave off his whoring and drinking. What is required of Moore is nothing less than a morally transformed Eucharistic life. This becomes evident in Moore's hilarious exchange with his Jewish physician, a friend ironically named Gottlieb, love of God. Here Percy reveals both the existential hell of American hedonism as well as the true cure for it. Gottlieb regards lovemaking, as he calls it, as a natural activity like eating and drinking. And so he cannot fathom Moore's calling it sinful and guilt-laden when practiced outside marriage. And so in a, an hilarious dialogue of the deaf, Moore tries to explain to this spiritually opaque psychiatrist why, without a penitential and Eucharistic life, he is truly a dead and damned soul. This exchange goes on a lot longer, but this is the funniest part of it. Gottlieb, you are saying that lovemaking is not a natural activity like eating and drinking? No, I didn't say it wasn't natural, but sinful and guilt-laden, not guilt-laden, then sinful, only between persons not married to each other. I understand then, since it is, quote, sinful, guilt feelings follow even though it is a pleasure. No, they don't follow. Then what worries you if you don't feel guilty? That's what worries me, not feeling guilty. What I don't see Gottlieb declares, is that if there is no guilt after, of course he uses the French, an affair, what is the problem? The problem is that if there is no gift, guilt, contrition, and purpose of amendment, the sin cannot be forgiven. What does that mean, operationally speaking? <laughs> the adverb there is one. Gottlieb is just completely, he's, he's a Jew with a God love is his name and he doesn't get ahead of a clue. What does that mean, operationally speaking? It means you don't have life in you. Unless you think that, of course, is a distinctively Catholic moment, that's word, those are the very words of the Gospel of John. If you drink not my blood and eat not my flesh, you do not have life in you. The penultimate fourth revelation that marks the beginning of Moore's Vita Nuova comes near the end of the novel as he proves finally unable to resist the twitch upon the tangled thread of his life. It occurs when he ponders the refusal of his daughter, Samantha, to seek out a miraculous cure in the baths at Lourdes. In one of the novel's darkest confessions, Moore explains why he did not take her there himself. This is the next to last quotation on your sheet. I don't know Samantha's reasons for not wanting to go, but I was afraid that she might be cured. What then? Suppose you ask God for a miracle and God says, yes, very well. How do you live the rest of your life? She's dead, she's died in the meantime of a neuroblastoma that's pushed out one eye over, over to the top of her forehead. Samantha, forgive me. I'm sorry you suffered and died. My heart broke. But there have been times when I was not above enjoying it. Is it possible to live without feasting on death 
of course, to use Kierkegaard's terms, without feasting on despair. And here, Percy, I think, strikes deepest of all. Moore confesses that he is himself the chief denizen of this latter day hell. He has found a curious delectation in the wretched condition of his own culture, leaving, living a funny, sad life of satirical mockery. So long as the world lies in ruins, then why shouldn't he remain content with his lusting and drinking? There's a, there's a line in Kierkegaard where he says, there is the proverbial man whom if you brought him happiness on a silver tray would say, leave the room. How, you, how dare you take away my unhappiness? It's exactly Moore's problem. Our worst fear, Percy suggests, is not that God is dead. Our worst fear that God is all too much alive. Nearer to us than our own breath. Knowing us infinitely better than we know ourselves. It is indeed a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And yet the gospel of Jesus Christ demands nothing less than it gives, namely, everything. There are no half measures. Total transformation is the strict requirement of the Christian life that we're called to live in making our exit from this present hellish age. And so, in a redemptively reverse manner, Moore finds himself backing into the kingdom. When Father Ronaldo Smith, pastor of this little Catholic remnant, seeks to strive more on Christmas Eve, five years after the novel's main action closes, Moore confesses his sin in a single sentence. I do not recall the number of occasions, Father, but I accuse myself of drunkenness, lusts, envies, fornication, delight in the misfortune of others, and loving myself better than God and other men. Though Moore can make his confessio oris, he is powerless to exhibit any contritio cordis. He has no sorrow of heart. He is what Graham Greene calls a burnt out case a virtual corpse of a soul, incapable of feeling much of anything, whether delight or regret. All he can say is, I am sorry for not being sorry. Father Smith knows in the marvelous mathematics of divine grace, a double negative constitutes a bare minimal positive. Accordingly, the humble priest assigns more an appropriate satisfactio operis, penance. The bad Catholic physician must make public penance by dousing his hair with ashes and wearing a sweater made of burlap in public. And so more attends midnight mass for the first time in many years, eating Christ once again, as he graphically puts it, and thus having life restored to him. Early on Christmas morning, therefore, Moore finds himself embarking on his stumbling path toward paradise in the last quote on your sheet. Barbecuing, this is the ultimate southern activity, in my sackcloth. The turkey is smoking well. The night is clear, it's been, of course, midnight mass, and he's barbecuing at 3 or 4 a.m. The night is clear and cold. There's no moon. The light of the transmitter lies hard by Jupiter. Notice he's looking out, away from himself. Ruby and diamond in the plush velvet sky. Ellen Oglethorpe, his wife, is in the kitchen fixing stuffing and sweet potatoes. Somewhere in the swamp, a screech owl cries. I'm dancing around to keep warm, hands in pockets. It is a Christmas day and the Lord is here. A holy night. And surely that is all one needs. Note well, Percy doesn't end at that point. On the other hand, I want a drink. Fetching the early times from a clump of palmetto. You know, alcoholics hide their liquor. He's hid his in a palmetto bush. Fetching, he says, the early times from a clump of palmetto. I take six drinks in six minutes. Now I'm dancing and singing old Sinatra songs and the Salve Regina 
Come, cutting the fool like David before the ark, or like Walter Houston dancing a jig when he struck it rich in the Sierra Madre. It's a great, great final line. And so Walker Percy gives fictional life to our contemporary hell, ruled by the prince of this world in both its bestial and angelic expressions. He reveals that we are already inhabiting a city of the dead, consisting of the corpses of souls. Percy warns against slothfully resigning ourselves to existence in this earthly hell, even though we know that it will eventually work its own self-destruction. Yet he also cautions against our rising up in wrath against these demonic forces, lest we remake ourselves in their image by returning evil for evil. This, then, is the more excellent way that lies not in the redemption of solitary souls living in invisible spiritual inwardness, but found instead in the sacramental and communal life of the body of Christ called the church. Thank you very much. I'll be accused of talking so long so I couldn't get questions. That probably is right. Could I offer just a word of, uh, of advertisement, if I might, to his embarrassment? My two great loves are Flannery O'Connor and Walker Percy. I am at the lowest person in the room on the totem pole of Kierkegaard studies. I'm a little higher on the world of Percy studies. The only kind of expertise I can claim is the knowledge of Flannery O'Connor's work. The one book that puts together Percy and O'Connor profoundly, in my view, Un, thus far unsurpassedly is John Sykes' book called Flannery O'Connor, Walker Percy, and the Aesthetic of Revelation. I could not commend it more highly, though I'm embarrassing him terribly. look at that Camus novel again, though, as you say, he was a reader and admirer of Camus. He said, as Flannery O'Connor said, if only we Christians took our faith as seriously as the atheists take theirs, then we might have hope. So he never was eager to com condemn Camus, but he could, could well be offering a kind of answer to Camus, certainly insofar as Father Rieur is obsessed, as you know, uh, Arir is obsessed with the suffering of children. Percy is certainly seeking to answer him on that score. But I don't know about, uh, about the other case. Second the last question. question is, is there any resonance with evidence of the wasteland in terms of what uh, Percy's uh, 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 Yeah, again, the question is reference, uh, allusion to the wasteland. I think Percy was so afraid of borrowing from Eliot <laughs> that he, um, he avoided it. I mean, they share the same cultural world of ours as being an ash heap. But I don't think, some of you who know Percy well, I can't think of any overt allusions to the wasteland anywhere in Percy. 